How do people visualize Alberta? Do we see it as forestry, energy, agriculture, transportation, residential? Do we see it for our wildlife, for our water quality? Most people would say that they see Alberta as providing all of those services. But a province that has historically been viewed as quite large, with relatively little going on, is in the last several decades become a very busy place and clearly we need new policy to shape the direction in which we're going. The concept that we can do everything everywhere all the time is no longer a valid piece of policy and that's one of the reasons why Alberta is embarked on the Alberta Land Use Framework. So let's set the stage, let's understand how we got to where we are the last 100 years, let's describe today's landscape in the province of Alberta, but most importantly, we need to begin to think about management by objective. Where do we want this province to be in 50 years? And what suite of policies will take us from where we are to where we want to go? Each of these policies will have benefits. Each will have liabilities, just like land uses. So we can actually examine the merits and the anxieties that attend different policies. We need to do that. Alberta needs to think about the architecture that will shape this province and take us to a place where our grandkids will be well served. Now land uses are not constant but they're dynamic. There was a time in the province of Alberta where all land uses were driven by First Nations people. Now that is no longer the dominant land use in Alberta. That was replaced by a period of time where almost all people were involved directly or indirectly in the harvest of bison. And that was replaced in turn by a very important period of time where Alberta's history was characterized by trapping. Shortly thereafter, the arrival of forestry occurred, but it's never been a dominant land use, at least not from the standpoint of political leverage or employment. But many Albertans today um, share a history in agriculture. A lot of us are second, third, and fourth generation agriculturalists. And that land use grew, dominated, and, but today is not as common or as dominant as it used to be. Today's economy is driven by the hydrocarbon sector, by the energy sector. It is the dominant land use that shapes who we are our royalties are rents and a very active player on the land use spectrum in Alberta. So today's Alberta is being shaped by multiple overlapping land use practices, all of which are growing. And this is shown very nicely by this dark sky image that shows how bright Alberta is relative to its north, south, east and west neighbors. Light emission being a very good proxy of land use intensity. The brighter the light, the more GDP. So it's a very good indication of overall economic activity levels. Now if you look at the, these lights in detail, you realize of course they're driven by land use. And we conduct land use so we can grow commodities. So if we look at all the commodities we produce in the province of Alberta, there's no other chunk of landscape in North America, comparable in size, that produces as many commodities as we do in the province of Alberta. And so here you get to see them, whether it be cattle or pigs or poultry or crops or natural gas, conventional oil, bitumen coal or electricity. Well to do that we had to transform the landscape. We have transformed 11 million hectares of Alberta from native prairie and parkland and foothills into cultivated crops. Another 14 million hectares is currently allocated for grazing by cattle either on the private lands or public lands of Alberta. Over 24 million hectares is allocated for forest management agreement areas and about half of that, about 12 million hectares, is our merchantable land base inside our forest management agreements and they have to be harvested once every 100 years. We have another quarter million hectares or thereabouts dedicated right now to the direct footprint of cities and towns and 340,000 hectares for those people that live outside of cities. Those are people who live on acreages and live on farms. 1.1 million hectares today is in the direct footprint of the energy sector. That's the seismic lines, well sites, pipelines and processing plants of the hydrocarbon sector. 400,000 hectares is directly in the footprint of transportation. Roads, whether it be small roads or large roads. And many hectares in a rapidly increasing recreational footprint. So these are our golf courses, ski areas, parks. So I think because of that, we need to begin to think of Alberta as a blueprint. Just much like we would in terms of building a house. It has a series of different rooms. We need to think about what we're going to do in each and every one of the rooms. Where are we going to get our crops, our forestry? Where are we going to live? So we need to, at both the provincial scale and at the regional scale, think about how we build this province, the macro architecture. And clearly it's going to mean that not everyone can do everything everywhere all the time. So why do we have land uses? Because we have people. How has the population changed? Well, here we're seeing the population grow from, what, 40 or 50,000 people at the turn of the last century to the 3.6 million people we have today and a significant concentration in the Edmonton-Calgary corridor that houses three out of every four Albertans. 
Now back in the 30s, about 80% of Albertans were rural. Today, 80% of Albertans live in cities and towns. 14% live on acreages and the remaining 6% are farmers. So we've seen a very rapid transformation of this landscape, but most people living in the Edmonton Calgary Corridor. And in this graph, we see that the population has been growing at about 1.8% per year to the 3.6 million people we have today, give or take a few. And if we continue to grow at that rate, between 2005 and 2055, we will have 7.5 million people. That means we're going to put an additional 3.9 million people. Many of those will be in the Edmonton Calgary Corridor. I just remind people of how quickly this has changed. Here we look at the capital city of, of Edmonton, here sitting in 1951 at about 76 square kilometers. Here's how it grew to 2007, where it's now at around 433 square kilometers. And if it continues to grow in area in a, at the same pace, by 2057, Edmonton will be more than 2,000 square kilometers and consuming the satellite communities around it. So the cities are growing very quickly. And as they grow, they consume area. So right now, all of our cities and towns together and our acreages is about 5,000 square kilometers. But by 2055, it's going to be at 14,000 square kilometers, meaning that we need to expand by 9,000 square kilometers between 2005 and 2055. That's 0.9 million hectares. And a lot of that land is going to be in the Edmonton Calgary Corridor. And if you look at the average value of a square kilometer at about $1.5 million per square kilometer, that represents about $14 billion in today's dollar value. And so that's one of the key reasons why Alberta's major cities grow out, not up, is there's a lot of money to be made by consuming peripheral land. And one of the conversations we need to have is the benefits of growing up rather than out. Urban sprawl is a big issue in Alberta. And I'd like to illustrate that just from the standpoint of soils. Here on the left, you see a map of Alberta and its soils, those dark black soils. Those are our black chermosemic soils. Those are the best soils we have in Alberta. And if we lay over the Edmonton Calgary corridor, as you see in the slide now, you see that there's a significant overlap between where most people live and where the soils are. Well, it's not surprising. These cities were established based on two factors, good soils and proximity to water. So as we continue to expand our cities, we are consuming, we're paving over these best agricultural soils in the province of Alberta, and we will lose about 900,000 hectares of good soils in the next four to five decades. Now, one of the most important land uses in Alberta in the last several decades has been that of agriculture. Here in the graph, you get to see how agriculture has expanded in area, and we're not including the improved pasture, so the total amount of agricultural land is even higher than that. But the point is that most of the growth has already occurred, and one of the key dynamics here is agriculture is continuing to expand at about 8,000 hectares every single year in terms of forage and cereal crops. But that doesn't mean it's getting bigger because it's actually being eaten into by roads, expanding settlements, cities, and the footprint of the energy sector at about 15,000 hectares per year. So agriculture is actually going to get smaller in the future, and that's going to have some implications to food production. So here we look at how it's growing and where it's going in the future. Here we see a map of how agriculture expanded. So in the early 1900s, moving through the short and tall grass prairies, west into the foothills, north into the parkland, the Peace River area takes off, and we gradually increase the amount of area and intensity of agriculture to the, you know, what, 20% of the province today. And here you get to see the distribution of agriculture. Most of it in the Edmonton Calgary Corridor, the Peace River area is, of course, very important. Now, on the livestock side, it also has expanded through time. So here you get to see in the graph on the right how we moved to say 7 million head of cattle in the province of Alberta. And most of them, of course, are in the Edmonton Calgary Corridor and livestock, particularly cattle, uh, need access to good forage. And so there's a really interesting concordance between where we grew our forage crops and where we have our cattle. So that cattle population has increased a lot too. Now through time, agriculture has not remained constant in terms of intensity it's changed a lot. So the small farms and that you know often were mixed farms with a few cattle have been replaced with a strong dependency on feedlots or intensive livestock operations. We've also moved from small farms to far fewer, very, very large uniform or homogenous farms. So that we've lost a lot of the, it's called fine scale heterogeneity of farms. Um, fence lines have gone from being complex to being very uniform. So an agricultural sector that was very good at in terms of maintaining wildlife has become much more intensive, much larger in scale. 
Now, this is, of course, influenced biodiversity. So if we look at the map on the right produced by Alberta Agriculture, we get to see the hot spots in terms of where land use, particularly agriculture, is affected by biodiversity. And we see a very similar map from the ELSI's model on the left. And if we look at most of the species that are listed, either as endangered or threatened or of concern, not all, but most of them are found in the white area, privately owned part of Alberta, and most of it occur where we have lots of agriculture. So agriculture is a key player in terms of maintaining biodiversity or affecting it adversely. So let's move on to forestry. Forestry is a very important land use too, and here we get to see its arrival where forest management agreements get formalized in the 1950s and grow to, what, the 20 million hectares in Alberta today. Now we've had forestry since the mid-1800s in Alberta, but the intensive part of Forestry as a land use was formalized in the 1950s. And on the map, about half of the area in red, so that's about half the 20 million hectares, about 10 million hectares, needs to be logged once every 100 years. So here we get to see the increase in either softwood, that's the curve on the top, or hardwood, curve on the bottom. So we harvest about 14 million cubic meters of softwood every year in Alberta, about 8 million cubic meters of hardwood. So this is a graph of the cumulative amount of area that we've harvested from the forest sector in Alberta. So we've harvested about 2.6 million hectares already. And by the time we get to 2055, we will have harvested 7.3 million hectares. So that means another 4.7 million hectares need to be logged. And of course, how we harvest our commercial forest land bases significantly influence carbon, wildlife, and water. So it's an important issue that we understand how to harvest forests in a way that produces timber production, but also these other important values. Because if we don't, um, forestry can significantly affect things like water quality through runoff of sediment, particularly in areas that have steeper lands. Now, the energy sector is the most important land use we have in Alberta today in terms of jobs, royalties, and rent. So let's look at this one in a little bit of detail. And this map shows us how the total amount of well footprint has increased through time. And you get to see the various portions of Alberta that are very important in terms of the hydrocarbon sector. And we're talking here about conventional oil, natural gas, unconventional gas, unconventional oil, and bitumen, and coal. So you get to see the hot spots. And so it has grown exponentially. And though, even though conventional oil, we've gone past peak production in all likelihood, and it's starting to come down, and the same with natural gas, that doesn't mean that the energy sector is past its prime in the province of Alberta. In fact, I would argue it's embryonic because we have unconventional gases like coal bed methane, oil shale, and particularly in Alberta, the, the bitumen or oil sand industry is very young, embryonic, and growing very rapidly as we get to see here on this graph, um, looking at the different types of hydrocarbon production. Now the energy sector builds footprint. We express it in area and edge. So right now in the province of Alberta, there's about 1.5 million hectares, a direct footprint of the energy sector, and on edge, so that's the side of seismic lines and well sites and pipelines, 1.5 million kilometers. So if we look at where we're going to go in the next five decades, including reclamation, we have about 830,000 kilometers of new edge to produce and about 850,000 hectares associated with the energy sector. So a lot more activity in the oil and gas sector in the next half century in the province of Alberta. Now all of these land uses require transportation networks. So here we're looking at the total amount of roads we have in the province today. From minor roads to the major highways, it's 350,000 kilometers. And by the time we get to 2055, we will be up to 740,000 kilometers. So we need to build about 400,000 kilometers more of roads. Now these roads in the future are primarily going to cut blocks, are going to well sites, and are going to rural residences, acreages. And here we get to see, for the first time, the history of the development of roads in the province of Alberta coming in from Montana, coming from eastern Canada, as we fill in, as time marches on, the white area, the two-by-one-mile grid, and of course, the Peace River area gets its development. Outside of the white area and the green area, we're seeing lots of roads emerge that are going to well sites and cut blocks. And here is where we are today, upward to 500,000 kilometers of total transportation. That's not just roads, we're also putting in rails in here, too. So this province that seems so big with very little access, maybe 40, 50 years ago, now seems quite small. And there's lots of linear features, there's lots of transportation. So every day, and particularly on weekends, Albertans that are you know, relatively young and affluent are getting out on the landscape, particularly in the east slopes, to take advantage of all the various recreational pursuits. Well, this has actually become a problem now because a lot of these linear disturbances are not reclaiming the way that the forestry or the energy sector wanted them to because the average Albertan is out there and moving across seismic lines and down pipelines, and these features are persisting and they're also contributing to poor water quality. 
Now, what about transportation, the amount of distance we travel? We're up to about 0.56 trillion kilometers of total vehicular traffic since the time the first car came to Alberta. And by the time we get to 2055, we'll be about 2.7 trillion kilometers of personal vehicle travel. So that's another 2.2 trillion kilometers of travel. So we should be asking ourselves, how do we move around the landscape? Well, if we think about it, 2.2 trillion kilometers over the next 50 years, and if we consider that we pay people about 50 cents to travel a kilometer, what we think of depreciated costs for travel, that's $1.1 trillion. Well, if we look at that over 50 years, that's $22 billion a year. So maybe we should be thinking very seriously about how we move around the landscape, thinking outside the box and why we have this tremendous dependency on personal vehicles and commuting and the importance of rapid transit public transportation systems because the benefits, whether it be carbon or just lifestyle or commuting time, is key. So all of these land uses require water and they all affect the water quality. On the water demand side, and here we're keeping track of the cubic meters of water required for all land uses, every cow, every person, all the logging, energy, agriculture, transportation, we can see that it's grown exponentially. And we get to see also where the key demands are. And you get to see that most of it's in the white area and most of it's tied to agriculture and most of that is tied to irrigation. But there's water demand throughout the province and we get to see how it's grown. Now in terms of water quality, all these land uses affect the distribution or the movement of sediment, nitrogen and phosphorus. So starting at basically one, we get to see how water quality has diminished. Now the scale is only between one and 0.75. We get to see the water quality has significantly been reduced over the last 100 years. Most of the water quality deterioration has occurred in the white area and a lot of that is associated with how we conduct agriculture and how we build our settlements. Now we need to be reminded that almost all water, 80% of our surface water in Alberta is north of Edmonton, but 80% of the demand is south of Edmonton. So we're going to be seeing some challenges in the future and maybe, and I suspect, that land use will need to move further north. There will be a northward migration of water demand as uh, these land uses unfold and more water is required. And not surprisingly, it's the southern basins that have been fully allocated and now they're no longer available for additional water demand. We're now trading water off in the southern basins, the southern watersheds. And so land use is beginning to chase water further north. And we'll see more of that in the decades to come. Now if we add all of this together, look at water quality, water quantity, carbon, this is what ecologists would call environmental goods and services. We get to see how they have been declining or diminished through time and where these declines have occurred. And so again, there's your distribution of loss of ecological goods and services. Yeah, all these jobs and Royalties and rents that land uses create are wonderful, but there's also a trade-off, and the trade-off is ecological goods and services. And you can see that Alberta doesn't have water that is clean or as abundant, and the amount of carbon in our soils or in our trees has been diminished because of forestry and agriculture. So this is the trade-off. So if we look at the leadership historically in the province of Alberta, this leadership has generated policy, and this policy has been the drivers that have converted the landscape, the province of Alberta. So historically, the big drivers were that of the cultivation era, the emergence of clean or intensive farming, the policies that contributed to an expansion up to six million head of cattle, um, public land transportation network, particularly in the white area, and headwater logging of our commercial landscapes. These are the major policies that affected the natural resource industries in the province of Alberta over its first hundred years. And this affected ecological goods and services including the loss of many of our good soils, the loss of native plant communities, particularly the prairies and the parklands, the loss of biodiversity in native prairie and parkland communities, obviously. Many of the small water bodies, either moving or standing, were drained, and water has been significantly reduced in quality and quantity, of course. Now, in terms of looking forward, there'll be new drivers. What has happened in Alberta will not necessarily continue. The key drivers in the future are the industrial heartland as we choose through policy to process a significant volume of bitumen coming from the Fort McMurray area into that area just northeast of Edmonton. Urban sprawl is also a key policy, which, uh, and particularly in the Edmonton Calgary corridor, as we grow out versus up. And we need to rethink that policy in terms of looking at the, of the disadvantages to ecological goods and services. Rural residential, 14% of all Albertans wanting to live on acreages. That's a key driver in the future. Commodity processing, the secondary processing of timber and crops and livestock and hydrocarbon. 
So that is a key driver in terms of Alberta's future, but requires water and requires land. And as the cities expand, we are quickly displacing cropland and agriculturalists onto lands that don't have the same quality of soils. And of course, that pushes us to a dependency on greater intensification. Another key driver, of course, is recreation. We're young, we're affluent, and people want to get out and participate in recreation. So what will that cause in terms of ecological goods and services? A continued loss of good soils, um, continued fragmentation of our landscapes, surface water will probably continue to be reduced, uh, water quality continues to be degraded, and we lose the remaining prairies and parklands. So again, we see the land uses, without exception, create benefits, the jobs, the royalties, and rents but they also create challenges in terms of ecological goods and services. So Alberta has this natural resource production engine. Our leadership does a good job of recruiting and attracting foreign investment. We need employment, so we bring lots of people to Alberta. Immigration is very high in this province. We run that through a natural production system where we draw down on water and carbon and wood fiber and our hydrocarbons and we produce all these commodities. And I guess that's wonderful. However, Albertans are realizing that all of these land uses as they start at small and become bigger, draw down on our accounts of ecological goods and services. And Albertans are realizing that true economic performance is driven not only by commodity production and the fiscal metrics, but also by ecological goods and services. And these go up and down together. So if that's the case, we have to rethink the balance. Yes, commodity production is very important in the province of Alberta, but we have to think about our natural capital too. And what Albertans want leadership to do is look at these in some sort of integrated way. So we're looking at food, we're looking at fiber, we're looking at forages, but we're also looking at water quality, water quantity and carbon. And when we do it that way, what we realize is we have a new conversation. It's a, it's a conversation about trade-offs, about limits, about risk, it's about knowledge. We will have to abandon this concept that Albertans can do everything everywhere all the time and realize that we have to actively plan this landscape. We need to explicitly look at these trade-offs. We need good decisions and good policies that take us from where we are to where we want to go. Now part of this conversation is a realization that we need new economic instruments and the idea that we can only pay farmers for forages or livestock people for cattle or the forest sector for timber supply, that needs to change and we need to provide incentives to grow more than just those primary commodities and start rewarding land users for things like water quality, water quantity, and carbon. And that, of course, require new, new policy and new economic instruments if we're going to do a good job of not only maintaining jobs, royalties, and rents, but also natural capital. So GDP, which is our classic metric of economic performance, requires commodity production. Well, we're doing that fine in Alberta. I think it's becoming clear that true economic performance requires the maintenance of GDP, but ecological services product. If you put them together, you get true economic performance. And that's what our kids and our grandkids want of us today. So thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss uh, some very key and important issues to Alberta, understanding where we are, how we got here, and where we may be going in the future. <music>